Now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel for this evening to address the topic of diplomacy through sports, the globalization of sport and societal change. Each of the panelists has deep understanding, experience and commitment to the positive and transformative role that sports can play in society. Dr. Ashley Huffman joined the US State Department in January 2020, where she serves as a program specialist in the Division of Sports Diplomacy. She formerly worked with Athletes for Hope, where she was Global Director of Gender Equity. She is an experienced educator and entrepreneur in global sports diplomacy and women's empowerment movements. Throughout her career, Ashley's traveled the world, training more than 10,000 sports leaders from over 75 countries in sport for social change. Ashley is a graduate of the University of Tennessee with a PhD in sociocultural studies and a master's degree in sports, man sports management. As an undergraduate, Ashley was the captain of her basketball team at Eastern Kentucky University. And as a former professor at the University of Tennessee, Ashley also served as the lead faculty member for the Vol Leaders Academy, a program created to empower student athletes to use their platform as a force for good. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you. Detlef Schrempf is a German-American retired professional basketball player who spent 16 seasons in the NBA, including four right here in the Indi with the Indiana Pacers. He was a three-time NBA All-Star and represented Germany in the 1984 and 1992 Olympic Games. Detlef studied international business at the University of Washington, where he was an All-American basketball player. He joined the Coldstream Wealth Management Company in 2007. And the Dedlef Shrimp Foundation supported Northwest children and their families for 25 years. The foundation worked with the State Department to build a diplomatic outreach program through sports to Muslim countries. Dedlef was a founding board member of the Seafood Nutrition Partnership and now works with multiple charities. He's also leading a campaign for racial justice. I see a number of old Indiana friends of Dedlef on the call this evening and welcome to you and welcome to you Dedlef. Thanks, Larry. Greg Stremlaw is the president and chief executive officer of Indy Sports and Entertainment and Indy 11 Professional Soccer and is helping to lead the new 11 Park Development Project in Indianapolis. Prior to this, Mr. Stremlaw enjoyed a media and broadcast career as the president of Canadian Broadcasting Corporation Sports. He was selected to Toronto's Globe and Mail Power 50 list of the most influential sports leaders. Among other appointments, he is currently serving as co-chair of Fan Experience for the 2021 NCAA Men's Basketball Championship and on the board of the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame and also as a member of the Canadian Olympic Committee and has been an international voting delegate for the World Curling Federation, the International Bobsleigh and Skeleton Federation and the International Luge Federation. He has a Bachelor of Commerce from Western University in, in London, Ontario an MBA from the University of Maine, an MS Ed in Sports Management from the University of Miami, and he recently completed a Harvard Executive Education Program at Harvard Law School. Welcome, Greg. Thanks for having me, Larry. And Elizabeth Thompson is the Associate Director of the International Outreach and Education for the NCAA Eligibility Center. She holds degrees in both international relations and French from the University of Indianapolis. During her 11 years with the NCAA, Elizabeth has held various roles focused on international student athlete eligibility, from answering questions for NCAA member schools, students, and parents to oversee the international academic certification process. Her current role entails educating prospective international student athletes on what it takes to become eligible for the NCAA and opportunities in the US. In this role, she's had the opportunity to travel to various embassies and consulates around the world to speak on higher education opportunities through sports. Personally, Elizabeth is also a supporter of the Field of Dreams Uganda, an organization whose mission is to provide hope, empowerment, and a future for the vulnerable children of Uganda through soccer and education. Elizabeth has also enjoyed opportunities to volunteer with Exodus Refugee here in Indianapolis. Through both their family adoption program and using her knowledge of French, she has helped teach the English language uh, evening classes to refugees from Francophone-speaking African countries. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. 
What a panel we have. I'm really excited about this. Our program moderator this evening will be my fellow board member, Bruce Frank. Bruce is a sole proprietor of Bruce R. Frank and Associates consulting firm. He's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania with a BA in biology and holds an MBA from the Wharton School of Business. He also attended the Universität Freiburg in Germany while playing professional basketball there for USC Freiburg. He's worked for companies in Germany, oh, the USA, <laughs> such as McKinsey, Baxter Travenal, and Roche Diagnostics, and he speaks fluent German. I'm trying to know. That, that, that look can tell us if he speaks fluent German or yeah, not. So on behalf of ICWA, <laughs> on behalf of ICWA and the Nebraska World Affairs Council, I welcome all of you to this evening's program, and I turn this over now to our moderator, Bruce Frank, and the panel of experts. Okay, thank you very much, Larry. And uh, whenever I'm on the listening end of this, I'm always just dying to get to the speakers and get through this introductory stuff. So I'll get out of the way as quick as I can. Um, what we're gonna try and do here is just pull out the experience and expertise of, of each of the panelists. Um, and if you, if you look at the organizations, we've got the State Department, the NCAA, we've got a, 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 a private business and we've got a, uh, and, and an individual, ah, my brother, and we had an individual. So it's a scalar of experiences um, uh, that we hope to uh, put the whole mos mos mosaic uh, together. As we go through the talk and you have questions or comments, chat me up directly to me. Let's not wait. Uh, we'll try this. Maybe it won't work. Maybe it will. Um, but if you have a comment uh, uh, or a reaction to something said, get it to me and I'll bring it in so that we can have a free flow of, of, of a conversation. What we're hoping for is uh, just uh, that the conversation takes on a life of its own and one goes to the next. And the speakers also, please jump in as you see fit that brings one to two, two to four, four to eight, and eight to 16. We'll get this done. So if I, uh, I'll start with uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, or, or Ashley, actually at the State, the State Department. Um, apparently, and I didn't know this, there is a division um, to do uh, to promote athletics internationally for global diplomacy. Could you tell us about that, what the government's trying to do, and how you're trying to do it? Yes, absolutely. And Larry and team, Bruce, thank you all for having us. Uh, it's a real honor to talk to this audience today, and uh, I'm excited to learn from the panel. Wow, amazing people on here. Uh, so yes, I'll tell you a little bit about sports diplomacy. We are a division within the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, which means we focus a lot on international exchange. This idea of peace through understanding, people to people, uh, that's what we do. We use the universal language of sport to connect people in a way that, and reach people in a way that maybe ambassadors or governments cannot. So I like to say we're the best kept secret at state um, because most people don't know about us. We're a mighty team of, of seven people working on pretty large scale issues, you know, sport and politics. When you think about that and the, all of the intersections around mega events or policy creation, um, but also grassroots programming and uh, who has access to sport and who doesn't and why and why not? Why and why or why not? And how do we improve that? And so we use the power of sport really for four things. We use the power of sport to teach important life skills right? All of you who have played sports know that you learn incredible values and in life lessons like teamwork, resilience, discipline, humility, um, innovation, all values that are important to being a good citizen, a good human being. Uh, so that's one thing that we use the power of sport. We use the game to teach important life skills. We use the power of sport to address key foreign policy priorities, whether that be gender equality, disability rights, environmentalism, racial and ethnic inclusion, or interfaith dialogue, we're using sport as a means to achieve some of our foundational principles of equality, freedom, justice. Uh, we use sport really to showcase the best of America. I mean, athletes uh, are really, the, I mean, they've reached a pinnacle in their career where people look up to them, they admire them, they're on their social media feeds, they're on their computer screens, in on their TV screens, and you know, it's really about um, what you can achieve through hard work, right? So we use it to showcase the best of America and we use sport to promote peace uh, through a shared humanity. Uh, what do we have in common? Uh, well, we have some, a game that we love and you know, sport is the best school for life. 
It's where the stakes are high, emotions are real, and outcomes and consequences exist. And so it's really your best practice round for life. And so we use it as that teacher. And we work on everything from grassroots to governance. Can you give an example of a program that we might recognize uh, that is a, an example of what you do and how, what form it takes? Uh, actually, we could, we could turn it over to Detlef because he traveled for us as a sports envoy in 2013 to Nigeria. So he can maybe share a little bit more okay. about Detlef, what the actual happened? program. What happened? Well, are we skipping right to that? Because we're, <laughs> we're getting right to it. All right. Well, um, well, first of all, let me take a step back and first of all, thank uh, Larry for the kind words. My former neighbor in Indiana, Larry. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, also, uh, just I'm honored to be part of this panel, and I hope I can provide some value, uh, obviously more from the experience side. But yes, um, Ashley talked about the best kept secret of the State Department, and I found that out many years ago when uh, I was doing basketball camps in Europe um, with Adidas. It was kind of part of my deal when I was playing, and uh, because I really enjoyed uh, you know, I had the passion for the game. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy teaching the game the proper way. And then uh, during, our, uh, while we were having our foundation in Seattle, a friend of mine who volunteered for us, he went to work in DC. And he ended up telling us that the State Dep uh, Department gives out grants for certain, you know, travel schedules, events, clinics, camps, whatever. So we looked into it and uh, applied for government grants to basically um, do an outreach program to a Muslim country through sports. So over the years, um, I think in a six year span, we uh, ended up going to the Philippines, Malaysia, Morocco, uh, and Jordan. And we did uh, basketball camps, clinics, we in, in attended events, we uh, had huge dinners at the embassies, uh, and we worked with the embassies and the State Department to put these trips together. And um, we typically took a handful of U.S. coaches with us, young U.S. coaches uh, who had just a great experience going to these countries. And every year we brought six to eight students back from those countries to spend a week in Seattle, stay with the host family and attend the high school uh, during that week. It was quite the experience for all people involved, even the host families who you know, were hosting kids from Morocco or Malaysia. Um, it's just, just a great experience. And uh, again, that you know, best kept secret from the State Department helped us out. Okay. All right, let's move on then to the NCAA. And uh, I don't mean it derogatorily, uh, uh, but a semi government organization uh, versus, for instance, the uh, Indy 11. What's your goal on the programs that you run to bring students over here? Because in our conversation, Elizabeth, you do not take U.S. students uh, internationally. You bring international students over here, which is a big difference. Um, um, but what, 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 what's your goal and how do you go about achieving it? Thanks, Bruce, and thank you, Larry, and everyone for having me. Um, I think it's very much an organic process that we support. So as coaches continue to want to recruit at the most elite levels, we see more and more international student athletes coming over to the States every year. You know, top sports like tennis and soccer and ice hockey have a very large number of international student athletes. We work very largely with the State Department and their Education USA program, as well as their sports diplomacy program. Um, some of those grants like Detlef mentioned um, have allowed us opportunities to travel overseas and speak at embassies and consulates, ultimately to educate students on what educational opportunities are here that they may not have back at home that their sport can provide them. So making sure that they're aware of what they need to achieve at that academic level. What does this term amateurism mean? Um, not all countries are as familiar with our amateur model. So making sure that we educate students at a young age so that they don't rule out that opportunity to come to the States, but ultimately so that the experience for our student athletes is as diverse as possible to create inclusion. We want our student athletes to go on professionally, not only in their sport, but in their careers. And so much of what Ashley had mentioned about how a team model creates you, some of those characteristics, um, you know, just being inclusive and being open-minded to other cultures is a huge part of what we hope to bring to our campuses and to our teams. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, because I'm coming back to the title. World uh, global uh, diplomacy through sports and globalization and so, uh, social change. Uh, and it, so far we come back to the State Department and then working with Detlef and his programs and the NCAA uh, with their program. How, uh, are you, uh, and we've heard bringing kids over here, um, are we getting diplomacy or, or what is your goal then of, of towards the d diplomacy and better, p better understanding and peace through understanding? Yeah, I think when we talk about peace through understanding, the, the ultimate goal is it really happens at that grassroots level individually okay. with each of those student athletes. So our goal again is to ensure that there is a diverse team and an inclusive team. So whatever that we can do to educate these other countries on opportunities to come to the States, ultimately the coaches are going to recruit who they want to recruit. So we don't have control over what those teams are made up of, but we want to make sure that when that happens, when those teams get together, that there is that understanding of other cultures. We even see it internationally student to student. So we're not talking just a student from Germany and a student from the United States. You may have two students on a team from conflicting countries that ultimately they may not see eye to eye or initially did not see eye to eye um, and may have had challenges but when you look at the this fact that they have to put those differences aside to compete for the same team they're practicing side by side eating meals together study tables it really gives them an opportunity over two three four possible years to open their minds and, to, and then they take that knowledge and that understanding back home to their immediate circles, to their colleagues, to their friends and their families. And I think that's really through the collegiate sports model, that's really how diplomacy happens. It's just mm -hmm. right there on those teams. Okay. Uh, Greg, don't want to have you. Uh, you have a different environment with a, a, a private organization running a professional team, soccer. Uh, I don't know what the percent of, of foreign players are on your team, but you're recruiting them. And as the CEO of the Indy 11, I see you as a, a mini UN and you're the uh, ambassador or the general counselor of the UN. How do you get all that, uh, all these cultures working together and where's the diplomacy involved in, in your life? No, I think it's a great question. Thanks for having me. I mean, certainly from a soccer perspective, we know it's uh it's, it's coined as the world's game, the beautiful game, and, and Indy 11 is no stranger to that, where we've got 13 different nations represented on a, a roster of 25, right? And uh, I think that just shows the globalization of bringing in talent to uh, showcase to the fans, not only here, but across the country. And you're right, uh, some speak English, some don't. Uh, we try to work with the International Center of, of uh, you know, uh, ensuring that language is there, that they understand the culture, what are some of the practices around the local community. Uh, but at the end of the day, these athletes have to come together and perform at the highest level, uh, you know, on the pitch with the game that they love, but they're also learning from each other. The more they learn from each other, in my experience, the better the high performance results on the field or on the ice or in, in you know, in the playground, whatever it might be. And so uh, it's a lot of fun to be involved with, uh, you know, from our end, this year, like everything in sport and entertainment and all sorts of industries has been a major challenge. I mean, really getting some of these incredible athletes into the United States over the last three months to, to construct a roster has been nearly impossible. Um, you know, that, that has been not just a pandemic, but obviously a change in administrations. And those two things alone, it's not a criticism, it's just reality that we're dealing with. We've had to, we've had to send, for example, a, a star striker from Venezuela to Spain uh, to be able to get a national exemption form and then back to Venezuela and then into the United States so he can train. And hopefully he's here by Friday. And by end of day Friday, we will actually have a squad, a team, to be able to furbish on the field to start to, to grow together. And, you know, uh, they're all in the bubble right now as well. And, and that's a challenge. Uh, although with that comes a lot of opportunities, just as we've seen with our own families, right? They've, they've really had to grow together, learn. They're spending so much time, and those are really their, their work family, so to speak, um, that we hope that we, they put it all together on the pitch, as they say, as we uh, as we get going for operations in May. Okay. Uh, I just got a, a chat. Jillian would like to make a comment. Uh, Adabole, can you unmute mute Jillian? And if you have questions or comments, uh, chat them to me. Bruce Frank, so that I can uh, either uh, have you ask them yourself or ask the questions for you.
Julian? I can't hear you. Hi, Bruce. I, I don't have a comment. Enjoying the discussion. Okay. Sorry. I didn't mean to put you on the spot then. Uh, Michael Adams from Nebraska has a question. Thanks, Bruce. Um, very interesting comments. Uh, Elizabeth, I have a question for you. Uh, so I'm, I'm based in Nebraska and we're very excited about uh, University of Nebraska's uh, football team going overseas for exhibition games. And uh, we, uh, we also have a sister city relationship with a city in Ireland. So for the last couple of years, we've been planning to have an exhibition game in Ireland. One year it was going to be with, uh, you know, the fighting Irish from Notre Dame, which would have been amazing. But, uh, you know, because of COVID, I think we've postponed it twice. Uh, any idea when those kinds of... Uh, exhibition matches will will start up again all right thanks for that question michael this might have to be a joint answer from both myself and ashley because i think you know ultimately we would all love to have a magic uh eight ball that would just tell us you know when we think that things are going to open back up and when it's going to be safe for um our international student athletes and our student athletes and our teams and our and our coaching staff to be able to travel again. Um, you know, we're even under travel restrictions still right now. So I think it's really going to depend on um, not only here in the States, but abroad when travel is safe again, when we see, you know, a more large stream vaccine rollout and know more about it. Um, but I don't know that I exactly have an answer right now. Um, I, I wish I did, but it's, it's really going to kind of determine where things progress in society globally, not just here in the States, um, of when that, that travel will be safe again. But Ashley, do you have any comments to add to that? Yeah, that? same. I mean, we've been on a programming pause since last March. Everything converted to virtual. And of course, the magic is in the, is in the dynamic when you're able to connect uh, humans in, in the same space. So it's hard, uh, especially when you're trying to teach a sport like basketball to do it over Zoom. But, um, you know, we hope, I mean, fingers crossed that by the end of this year, I mean, that's our goal is that we're working on various projects with in-person program programming components by the end of this year. It's a country by country situation. Uh, you know, when we're relegated to the phasing, um, so phase one, phase two, phase three. So when it's safe to travel again, when borders open, when there is enough of a vaccine, um, you know, in the various countries where we'll be, and when we sort out the issues around liability and medical cost coverage and all of those things, if you're going to send people somewhere, I mean, that's our job as as the State Department is to keep people safe, right? We're going to send you somewhere where you can thrive and remain secure, and so we have to take in all of those considerations. Actually, how do other countries do sports diplomacy? Is it different from the United States? You know, we were really a leader in that space. Um, we've been doing this for a long time and, and it was largely a, a result of 9-11. And so, you know, that's the, that's the impetus behind it. Although I feel like we've been, do, we've been doing this kind of sport for character development, sport for peace building, sport for international aid um, for a long time. It's just kind of the nature of our country and its citizens. But uh, we've been doing it since 2002 as a result of 9-11 to reach largely um, Pop, uh, boys uh, in certain regions of the world. And so it could sort of, you know, has gained momentum and, and is branched into so many different areas and professional development in sport uh, to, um, you know, mentorship, to envoy programs, sending Americans outbound to bring, you know, large groups of Americans in, or large groups of foreign born inbound. And so, we see now other countries doing that, but it, it looks like working groups. Um, it looks like um, projects through the Ministry of Sport. It looks like it's very different because we don't have a Ministry of Sport. And so we function in some ways like that, um, but we're focused a lot on the people to people exchange. So we touch on it, but it's not our primary role. Other places, um, sports diplomacy is run out of the ministry and that's a very different feel right? Because these are high performance athletes and it's, uh, I think, a different motivation. Mm -hmm. Detlef, you came over as a high school kid to play basketball or were you to come to the University of Washington? And when you came over to play basketball, you, uh, I assume your goal was to be a, 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 as good a basketball player as possible, but I also assume that you took on a diplomatic role for your home country, at least 
I'm speaking, uh, I'm mirroring right now my own experience. So what did you experience as a diplomat, a personal <laughs> diplomat? Well, I think, first of all, that's, that's high expectations for a 16 year old, right? I mean, I think when we talk about uh, allowing kids or bringing kids over from another country to, to go to school. I went to high school first as a, an exchange student. And back then there, there were no programs. You know, I wrote a letter to the high school coach because someone said that was a good program uh, through like three channels. And I had paperwork back later. I filed my student visa and then I, then I went to the state of Washington. Um, you know, I think the expectation is a little high to be a representative of your country because at that point, you know, you worry about learning English, you worry about fitting in, uh, you're in a new environment. And, and in, it took me quite a while to realize that I might be the first European or the first German that most of the people in that town have ever met. And so they might think that whatever, whoever I was or whatever I did is what everyone else was doing in Germany. So, you know, that eventually I learned that, well, there comes a little pressure with that because, yes, you're representing your country, but, you know, as a 16 year old, it's a little different than once I got into college and, you know, and we are on national TV and people are talking about my background, uh, you know, then you kind of go, well, that's a reflection of where you come from. So you have to uh, represent yourself a little better that way. Um, you know, I had, I was fortunate enough to do camps in, um, you know, in Asia, in, uh, in China, in Africa, in Europe. And back then, um, this was in a, probably 15 years ago, 20, 15 years ago, we took a U.S. all-star, you know, all-American high school players with us, five, six players every year to, to perform in those camps. And then we brought five, six players from those camps to the United States to perform and compete in an all-star tournament against the U.S. players. And uh, I had to have those conversations with those kids. You know, they're 16, 17 years old saying, hey, you're representing the United States. You're representing U.S. basketball. Uh, you know, and you're like in Europe, they're with the stars, right? Because, oh, my God, here are these kids. They're dunking and they're, they're doing amazing things. Uh, but they're still 16 years old. You know, I'm, I remember when I was 16, I was dumb. You know, I, I was insecure. Uh, and if you tell me, hey, you're representing the United States of America and, and act accordingly, be a leader, you know, maybe you're never a leader in your, in your life. So it, it's really hard to have those expectations for a high school kid and even a college kid. Now, if, when you come over after that in professional sports, uh, I, I think there's a, there's a time for you to mature and, and learn that. Hey, let's switch gears a little bit and come back to the Indy 11 um, and talk about uh, a potential female Soccer team. Do you yeah, have a well, uh, first off, for those that don't know, we are in the, the midst of trying to build out 11 Park. It's, uh, you know, a, a wonderful legacy facility that we're, uh, we're really looking forward to getting established. We're on the precipice of a potential location announcement for that. And while a lot of people think about a soccer specific stadium, it will be multi-purpose for all sorts of other sports as well, but specifically designed for men's and women's soccer. And you know, I have lots of things like boutique hotel and uh, lots of commercial office space and uh, all the things that come with that. But um, part of the plan is to bring in a women's professional team to Indianapolis, right? This wonderful sports community. Um, we have uh, gone on record saying we're going to do that and we want to use 11 Park as the, the entry point for it rather than playing in two different venues and not having the synergies and economies of scale. So the, the development will be built out for both women's and men's professional soccer and I uh, look forward to seeing that team here and thriving. Uh, we've shown with the 11 that, you know, we have a massive following, even though we're just in the very infancy stages, quite frankly, compared to many sports organizations that have been around for 50 or 100 years. You know, we're only seven years young and uh, we've, we've been elevated to a new league and we're, we play at the top tier now uh, within United Soccer League. And, you know, we were second in attendance overall uh, prior to the pandemic with about 11,000 fans a game at Lucas Oil Stadium. We have an asterisk next to our attendance last year where we did lead the North America and all soccer teams in attendance, but we we're also fortunate that we were able to have some fans, but we'll take it, right? I mean, the fact is we had health and safety policies to enable people to get into uh, the stadium and we, we reopened Lucas Oil Stadium and we were the first professional team of any sport to, uh, to, to resume play in, in, in this state. So yeah, women's professional soccer coming, uh, dates, exact dates and team name be determined, but uh, we're all in for that. Uh, Elizabeth, NCAA, um, does that figure into your plans of bringing uh, kids over to the United States and 
uh, could just talk about how that's changed uh, uh, the whole athletic world for females. Yeah, so, um, and Ashley, feel free to chime in at any point on this, because I know hearing your background, you're probably much more of an expert than me in this area. But I think, you know, just with the implementation of Title IX going back as, you know, early as 72, 1972, I think when that was implemented, um, the largest scale and impact that we see from that in the media is largely around sports and equal opportunity for women in sports. And I just see every year it growing astronomically as far as the number of women um, internationally that are recruited to come to the states. States. So as I mentioned earlier, sports like tennis and soccer and ice hockey, tennis alone, the entire sport across our three divisions is made up of 61% of international student athletes. So over half of all tennis players on the women's side are international student athletes. So I think that shows you, and I think in ice hockey, it's some somewhere around 42 or 44 percent. So the number of students that are coming over to the state, specifically females, to participate in sports just continues to grow every year. Um, there was a survey that was done um, that came out, I recall seeing through our Office of Inclusion that was done by the Women's Sports Foundation. And it found in that survey that was conducted, I think 2019 or 2020 was when that was done, don't cite me on it, um, that over 73% of female leaders said that their greatest concern regarding girls and women's participation in sports was the ability of their parents to afford some of those participation fees. So I think the opportunity for students to continue continue their education and not have to select between pursuing their sport or getting an education is so unique in the model that we have here. And it provides those opportunities to students that may not have been there otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, Ashley, uh, what do you see internationally about the uh, Title IX in the United States helping the development of women's athletics throughout the world? Yeah, absolutely. You can feel its footprint in every country that we've traveled to because you can see the groundswell of women and girls who are participating or want to participate. And they look at the model that we have, which is very unique uh, to any other sport club model in the world. And they see it as a real opportunity, you know, to, to also pursue education. And so, you know, I'm a product of Title IX. I was a college basketball player. I, I am who I am because of sport uh, as a woman, as a leader. And so I'm very thankful for that experience. And, you know, now we're in a position in the United States where we give out $2 billion or more in scholarships to female athletes. And so I think that number is just really impressive. And it's not a, yes, it is about sport, but it's also the educational piece, right? So then more women are doctors, are lawyers, are government employees, um, you know, who are change agents in society, who are catalyzing these efforts in different spheres. Um, and that's how you see culture shift is the investment in one then becomes the transformation of many. And so, you know, 61% of women's tennis is international, amazing. And then they're going back to their country and able to have that ripple effect, not just in sport, but in the lives of those who are in their sphere. And so I think it's, uh, I think it's amazing to see how Title IX has impacted our country and how it's a part of every exchange program we run and how it's leaving its footprint in many others. Mm -hmm. Actually, just to add to that, I also find it amazing how many former women student athletes I have worked with through the State Department and Education USA that have gone back to their home countries are now employed by Education USA and are using their experiences to continue to spread knowledge about those opportunities to women in their countries. So it's in creating their own programs. So it's it's great to see it continue to grow through your work. Yeah. yeah. Greg? Bruce, if I, yeah, Bruce, if I may, just I'd like to piggyback off that because I, I think it's a wonderful uh, topic, quite frankly, and I think it's it's so much larger than even I think a lot of people get. I mean, we're focusing on a lot of high performance athletes and coaches and then, you know, the gender equity in terms of, you know, using a catapult towards other opportunities. I'm going to share a real personal story. You know, I've, been, I've been a massive champion of gender equity for 25 years in the workplace, mostly because, you know, I believe in it uh, heavily. And it, it, it took a lot of people to actually tell me it's OK to be a male and actually champion other things, even though I'm not a female. Right. So. Um, I'm not picking a, a previous employer, but I'll use them as an example. You know, I was president of CBC Sports. It's a it's a large broadcasting rights holding broadcaster for the Olympics for six decades. Eight thousand employees I had uh, in the, in that corporation. Uh, from the sports unit standpoint, when I arrived, I was shocked to learn that 
every single executive producer was a male. So when you think about that, these are not just the athletes. These are the content creators in terms of who actually puts things on linear television, radio, uh, digital, social media, et cetera. Those are the filters. So we actually, we constructed a women in sport model as a, an RHB, a rights holding broadcaster for the IOC. And I remember a few years ago, we actually did a presentation of Buenos Aires, Argentina to all of the rights holding broadcasters around the world in terms of what our strap plan was and the pillars. And quite frankly, between all of this, everybody on the panel, it wasn't rocket science. It just took an organic understanding of why this was important and building out a plan and having everybody buy into that. It's now held up as a gold medal from an IOC standpoint internationally. And I'm really proud about that. I'm no longer part of CBC, but I love seeing all the great panels they're doing, the symposiums, you know, executive producers that are now equitable across the, across the stage. And so I just wanted to piggyback on that because I think it, it takes all of us to be you know, much more than just the athletes or, or the sports or the teams. It has to be from leadership and in all sorts of different industries that also have tentacles from sport. Yeah. yeah, and I would say just one last thing. When you look at what's happening now as a product of Title IX, you see women as owners, right? You see Naomi Osaka, you see Serena Williams, you see Angel Everywhere. City FC, predominantly owned by the 99ers Women's World Cup team. You see Chelsea Clinton and Jenna Bush Hager, now co-owners of the Washington Spirit women's soccer team here in DC. And so you see the rise in women now as owners, as media personnel, uh, you know, starting their own business, Alex Morgan and her new media company. Um, so I think there's a real shift because there was the opportunity that began in the 70s. And now you see women in positions of decision making. Detlef, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think you had a, a just a historical lucky break to be part of the 92 Olympics with the U.S. Dream Team and the basketball. Because uh, uh, just looking back in history, th that phenomena showed the world how to go global with a, with a sport. And I think soccer saw it, and tennis saw it, and basketball saw it, and... and I just felt the world contract and get closer to it. And uh, I think you were there, weren't you? What was it like? Well, you have to bring that up because I think we lost by 30. To the well, it team. could have been worse. It could have been much worse. Yeah, Those yeah, boys were but, good. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, um, I think it's just the evolution of, of like, you know, NCAA, college sports, pro sports, because, uh, you know, when I came over in high school, there was hardly uh, anybody from other countries uh, going to high school in the States. Uh, I think I had one kid from Chile that played on our soccer team and the soccer team wasn't very good. So he was the star. Uh, in college, I had uh, two other kids uh, that played with me uh, that were, uh, you know, one from Germany, I brought over another one from Iceland. And now when you look at the NBA, a third of the NBA is international. Yeah. Um, you know, and I've seen this transition. I was the first European player, um, you know, that had any success, stayed on board for a while. And now, uh, you know, you can see the imprint that international basketball has had on the NBA. Rule changes, a different style of play, um, and it's a global sport. And I think that's, that's why, you know, sports is so important uh, for us and for our relationships globally because people connect through that. They connect by playing a sport, by competing yeah. against each other, by cheering for or against each other, uh, you know, and it's, there's nothing really political about it. And, uh, and, and when you can connect with people and, and find something in common, there's a way that you can at least open up some form of communication. Mm -hmm. Craig. Don't, don't, don't talk about the dream team. I'm done with them. <laughs> yeah, well, they're not. <laughs> well, it, it, it was more than athletics. It was an event. The, that whole thing was an event and it started, uh, I look at soccer team, women's soccer team. It's better because of ten, Title IX and uh, the, certainly the tennis. Uh, uh, so, um, but Greg, if we had better soccer players that we could send over to Germany to play, would we have a kinder, gentler world? You know, I don't know. I mean, that's a tough question. I'm kind of gentler, but uh, I'd like to think it, it would be a better place. And I think we're getting there, right? I think the ecosystems continue to evolve. I mean, once upon a time, 
you know, soccer would have considered been considered and likely by some still a, a second tier sport in this country. I, I think that's a bit of a misnomer anymore. All we have to do is look at what MLS investment has done. New stadiums popping up across the country, investments, uh, companies involved, international players coming here from some of the best teams in the world, not just in Europe, but South America, et cetera. And we're now seeing the largest transfer fees in the history of the sport going the other way, which means we are developing wonderful athletes and professionals to go in, on to different pastures. So um, I'd like to think that the more that that occurs, I don't know if kinder and gentler, but I think uh, more awareness, more education, um, you, you know, more breaking down barriers, more commonality, all, all the things that uh, I know Ashley was talking about earlier. Um, I, when I was hearing some of those things, I actually I drew on a personal example when I was uh, in, in Canada uh, at Canada Olympic Park. And I don't know how many of your viewers or anybody on the panel that's been there, but I'm a huge, huge fan of what that facility does. You know, it was a host of the 1988 Winter Olympic Games. I was too young to work at the time there, but I inherited a, a legacy facility that had, you know, an Olympic world-class speed skating oval, a bobsleigh luge track, a high-performance Hague Glacier for high-altitude training, and athletes from all walks of life and every all sorts of different countries. Friend Winter came there to really uh, be better. And it was great because we put them up in accommodations, food and beverage, et cetera. And, you know, you get to see the Jamaican bobsleigh team on with, you know, uh, the Austrian bobsleigh team or you, you name it. And those were a lot of uh, fun times to see uh, the commonalities that were broken the, and, and kind of the misperceptions that even existed out there that maybe there was something that was political that somehow sport was actually helping to, to merge some of those those, 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 those peoples together. And, and that carried over into world championships and outside of competition into lifetime, you know, lifetime friendships. And, and so, while that's just a, a small ecosystem example there. Um, I think we can do a lot of other things like what I saw at COP Can Olympic park. And I, I say, I talk about it to, to today. It's just a, a wonderful concept. Okay. Uh, Betty Tonzing has a question for Ashley. Could we uh, allow her to ask her question? Yeah, I just unmuted. Um, Ashley, it's a very quick question. Um, how long has the sports diplomacy program been a part of the State Department? And I'll, I'll tell you why I'm asking. Okay, uh, 2002 is when our- Oh, okay, I didn't, yeah, you probably said that, I didn't catch it. Uh, I wondered, I think that's an incredible um, and a wonderful addition to diplomacy. I was in Africa for many years, um, in the 1980s to 93 and there was a young man there with the peace corps and i think he went over as a, as a as a tennis instructor and that he was asked to stay by the king because he the king wanted him to he was sent there to teach village village kids how to play tennis sports and then the king asked him to stay because he wanted him to teach his sons and then he was at a loss because he wanted to stay in Lesotho but there was no place for him and I remember we were talking with um, USAID at the time and, and maybe some of the embassy why isn't sports a part of our government structure it's what the world speaks to each other so i'm thrilled that they woke up and have realized this that's wonderful thank you yeah thanks for that story i mean we're here now and i i, I know a lot of friends that uh have uh been in the peace corps and they say their number one asset their greatest asset is a soccer ball that it's always the quickest really? and fastest way to break down those barriers is to just roll the ball out and play yes Absolutely. It speaks all languages. You know, it just, uh, you can bring 10 languages together and they, they know how to speak to each other. Exactly. Thank you. Elizabeth, bring come back to the NCAA. What challenges do you see for achieving your goals of bringing foreign students over here? With, uh, uh, all the social media we have and the viruses we have and what's the NCAA doing next? Sure. Um, that's a great question. It's kind of definitely twofold um, of things that make it easier and things that make it more challenging. I would actually argue that social media makes it more well known and makes more students want to come over here because 20 years ago, if someone left your country to go play in the United States, you may hear about it over summer break if they come back, if at all, you know, sometimes they don't come back until the end of college. Now with social media, students can follow their former 
teammates and former people to see their experience day by day on Instagram or Snapchat or Twitter. They can post from a game or on the road. And so I think that lends to exposure all around the world that we never had before. And it also leads to interest to continue to play. Um, the, the opposite side of that coin, I think, is exactly what you said with COVID-19 and the virus. It has created so many challenges. Um, as you know, so many schools went to solely online education this past year. Um, and as a result of that, the former administration had enacted some new policies that prevented students from being able to come over on an I-20 or an F-1 student visa to attend their university in the States if their university was solely Solely online or if all of their classes were solely online. So that posed quite a challenge for our student athletes because so now you're taking them out of practice, you're taking them out of being with their team. They're in their home country trying to continue their education and they're probably doing it in a different time zone. So they may be taking classes in the middle of the night um, or late into the evening and maybe still trying to get some type of training while in their home country. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work with ACE, the American Council on Education, um, to kind of voice our support for the international student population. So not just student athletes, but international students as whole. Um, you know, they have such an impact on our economy, on our campuses, on the diversity that they provide, not only for teams, but for the actual students just attending campus. Of, and that is something that is lacking right now due to some of the travel restrictions with COVID-19. So I think just as much as we want to see preseason games and our players getting to play in cool locations overseas, we want those students back on campus. That's, that's really, really important to us that in person education and interactions is something that you can't get in the virtual space. Yeah, okay. U.S. State Department policy and, and you may or may not be able to address it and just uh, do or do not so is specifically to baseball players from Cuba. And uh, the United States position towards Cuba. The question is, can't we uh, uh, improve our, our relations with Cuba, starting with sports? Great question. Um, yes, actually, I think in 2008, we sent Shaq to Cuba. Uh, it was under the Obama administration. And I mean, what, what better person to send to Cuba? Um, so when it, was an, it was a great experience. ESPN covered it. There's several stories. If you want to Google it, um, you can find Shaq's experience in Cuba. Uh, you know, it's just been it, everything about our job is related to <clears throat> what comes from the White House. And so the directives that come from the administration is how we execute. It's how the embassies decide which sports or uh, which target people groups they're trying to reach, whether it's women and girls or persons with disabilities or whatnot. And then they're trying to work on local issues with local partners to figure out what are the social issues we need to tap into. And then how do we call back to headquarters in DC, our office, and find those athletes and or people to execute. And so that's really how our programming works. We get a call from, let's say Cuba, and they say we want to do basketball. And we think, uh, you know, someone of high caliber would be a great fit here because we can reach um, disadvantaged youth and we can talk about peace building. And so they call us and then we call the NBA and the NBA helps us find those athletes. And so that's really how the, how the process works. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's on the docket. I think all uh, our goal is to have great relations with Cuba, of course, um, and sport is one tool in which we can do that. And so we're just waiting on the directives from the White House. Okay, Detlef, back to you uh, as an individual, private individual, you've created a foundation uh, trying to make the world a better place. Tell us what you're trying, what it is, what you're trying to do. Well, we're we had a foundation for 25 years and we started that when I got traded from Indiana and uh, back to Seattle. So, um, you know, now our goal at the point was our focus was and our passion were children. And obviously we had some. We're having we trouble were with the Mexican internet. Support the children, families, and let's get back to that. And then over the years, we added different things. Or internet. Yeah. 
We're having trouble with your internet. You have to go elsewhere for a minute until it's my yeah. back. Yeah, you're back. Try it again. Uh, sorry about that. Yes. Um, yeah. So you know, as I said earlier, we, over the years we added different things. We did the uh, the, the trips to Muslim countries uh, that were uh, via grants by the State Department, um, and and you know it it ran its course. Twenty five years, a long time. We raised over twenty million dollars, support a lot of charities, and my focus right now is is basically what I think we all should be focusing on, and is that's doing the right thing. You know, spending time on. Um, equality, equity, justice for all, uh, inclusion, diversity, you know, all those things that, that we talk about everyone should have, but is not reality. Uh, so I've started a campaign with a local group, mostly uh, pro athletes and entertainers, and we started a race to hate campaign. And that's what I'm focusing my off hours on. Um, because, I mean, honestly, uh, if you have a chance to look at it, uh, we have a logo that says Erase the Hate. And it's a, a heart that's half black, half white. And uh, we, our babysitters made that logo uh, after the LA riots in the 90s. Hmm. And, and, you know, and, and that's scary because we're still talking about the same thing 25 plus years later. Um, so to me, that's, that's very important. Uh, I care about the community I live in uh, and the country I live in. And I think uh, sports has given me that platform to address it, like it or not. Do you still have German citizenship? Um, no, I do no. not. Because back then when uh, we became U.S. citizens, uh, you had to, uh, you were only allowed to have one. Germany didn't okay. recognize dual citizenship. So they okay. actually cut my passport in front of me. Oh, oh how dramatic. Yes. <laughs> the German way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very good. Great. Challenges for diplomacy and getting all your cultures together at the Indy 11. What are you going to do next? I, honestly, I, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't see it as a challenge. I, uh, I, I spin that around. I think it's a massive opportunity. Again, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of self-actualization if you believe in that Maslow's hierarchy of with those groups coming together and, and bonding as one, as I talked about before, I, it's a work family. I mean, it's, it is a business for these, these athletes, these players, but you know, they bring uh, their families with them and that this, this becomes their, their home. And, and so part of our role is to foster that development, right? Give them opportunities to not just be athletes on the pitch, but to, to, uh, to excel and, and to develop off the pitch as well. And so I, honestly, it sounds maybe a little bit um, corny. I, I don't, I don't see it as a challenge. I see it as uh, every time we have a, a fresh slate, if you will, and there's always going to be some players that come in and out of any roster. That's just professional sport uh there's there's very few teams that stick together year in and year out those days seem to be done in in, in all the majors anyhow and so it, it becomes part of our process uh, the front office and the coaching staff to a um build a culture right the first thing i did here when i got to indianapolis was and people thought it was a little bit odd is my first senior hire was a director of culture period that's her role that's what she does um, you know, a lot of people thought that was very strange. It was the first position in the league in soccer uh, here in the U.S. to have that. I think she does a tremendous job. And part of that is a permeated culture, not only for executives and people that are in, you know, law, marketing, operations, game day, that type of stuff. But also what the coaches, the technical staff, uh, the massage therapists, the medical practitioners and the players are doing. And it's been a little bit more challenging because of the proverbial bubble that, you know, about 40 of those uh, persons are in. Um, I chose not to go in the bubble last year. And I'll be very honest, that was a mistake. Um, I did not think it was essential. And we were dealing with pandemic and learning on, as we go. And so we kept players and coaches and that culture started to separate a little bit. This year, we're changing things up. I'm in the bubble as an example, as are some others. So the connectivity can really be enhanced. And um, I do think we're going to see the fruits of our laborers from a cultural standpoint pay off with results on the field this year as well. And I think culture is a, is a premium way uh, to do that. How many countries are on your team? So we've got uh, 11 on roster, two on the coaching staff, three, uh, including the United States, but 13 different countries outside of the U S. So we've got, you... we've got Mali, Ghana, uh, Venezuela, Bosnia, Germany, Ireland, 
um, England, Canada, Trinidad, Tobago. Yeah, it's 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 we're pretty flush with internationals. Program? How do you uh, create one team out of all that? Sorry, you broke up there a little bit, Bruce. Do you have a, a, a way to create one team out of all those different cultures? Yeah, I mean, again, I think somebody had said, you know, when you do end up throwing a soccer ball on the field, there's a lot of gravitation towards that. So um, a lot of communication, right? And there's a lot of different ways to communicate. It, it doesn't always have to be the same way. So trying to find the best ways to communicate with each one of those, those players and coaches, uh, shared interests, we're all in it together. And that team doesn't thrive unless all of those players and coaches come together. Right. I mean, not, not every roster is going to be a dream team like 92 for the U S basketball. Uh, but even that group had to come together, right? We've all seen all-star teams in all sorts of sports through the years that have failed and, and some have failed miserably. And uh, uh, my opinion is that's because they didn't openly communicate and they didn't break down those barriers and they didn't come together. So for us, um, we've also tried to recruit players that we think will, um, take culture very seriously and, and will fit into the culture we're trying to create, right? Uh, and and that, that, that removes the proverbial I out of the equation, and it's about us. It's the collective. Um, and then we grow that further into what do our large support supporters do and our fans and, you know, our corporate partners. And it is a total ecosystem of partnerships, but it all starts at that core, very athlete-centric and, and very athlete-driven. That, if you were, I'll say, at the uh, not at the start of the internationalization of basketball, but certainly not where we are now. What was it like being the, the foreigner on the team of an NBA team? <laughs> well, back in those days, I was the uh, the outsider. Of course, mm -hmm. I was uh, literally the only one, uh, you know, on my team. Uh, I had actually a teammate from Germany also for a year, uh, but in the league there weren't many. Uh, but just to add to what Greg said, you know, we keep always, we always talk about, you know, we want everyone to come and, and, and be part of this culture. And I think when you bring in all these international players, they actually make the culture, right? Because uh, you can say this is our culture and you got to buy into it. But uh, when you have players from different continents and different countries with different backgrounds, uh, different ways of doing things, maybe studying or practicing or how they approach life. It teaches everyone. And I think uh, it has made the, uh, the experience better for everyone. It's made uh, the American players better. Uh, you know, for me, it was, you know, it was totally new. I'm playing and I'm learning every day from American players, from people that grew up in, you know, different areas of the country, um, with different backgrounds um, and it, it was, every day was a learning experience and I, hopefully I, I brought something to the table um, even if it was just the, uh, the German work ethic and stubbornness I don't know whatever that was but I hope I brought something to the table and nowadays you know you have, you have teams where half the players in the NBA are international yeah. and they seem to have a family feel uh, that you know you want, you want as a team and uh, and, and that's hard to do when people are getting paid millions of dollars. Yeah, I, I, I would love to deal with that problem eventually, perhaps tomorrow. Uh, Ashley, uh, the U.S. government has a goal. I mean, you're not in here. Uh, uh, we want to project our image. We want to uh, 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 project our power. Um, how, do you, how do you work with other countries uh, in order to achieve your goals for the United States government? Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, our office, we're largely a funding source. Uh, we work with creative people like Detlef to then execute and implement. So we're working with a lot of American citizens as partners to sort of take this idea of either hosting a, a basketball team from Tanzania here in the United States or maybe going abroad. So I think it's a, a model that people maybe don't understand is that we provide funds and individual grants to people 
in the United States to sort of execute these projects. We also, as a State Department, are about 60% locally employed staff when you talk about our embassies. And so we're looking at people who have grown up in Germany and now they're working for the US Embassy. Who better to inform us on local issues than people who have lived there, who have grown up there, who understand the cultural context. And so that's also unique, I think, about our government is that we invest 60% of our US State Department salaries on people who are locals. And when it comes to sports diplomacy programming, all of our um, programs as it relates to sports envoys or as it relates to an outbound program, when we travel in country, there's always an implementing NGO or university that we work with. So whether it's uh, you know a grassroots agency or University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, they would be hosting us. And so I think that's a beautiful uh, example of how we work with other countries is that there's a lot of trust there and we rely on the expertise where it lives. Um, and so we don't go in and prescribe, but we listen to and respond. Uh, Elizabeth, we have a question about postgraduate diplomacy. Um, does the NCA have a program where you attract a foreign student over here? Uh, he or she will go through the four uh, years. Then what happens? Do they have to go home? Is there another uh, uh, way to continue their education? Or because it, it, uh, in the old days, um, it was quite unfair. The United States would attract PhD students and then they'd stay. And then we'd benefit from their, their, their education and their intelligence. Um, what, what's the NCA's position right now on after graduation? Um, I think it's really, again, it's a very fluid process. So we don't have any particular program in place to um, attract students over here. We educate like through the State Department and through the embassies, but ultimately <clears throat> that's happening through our coaching staffs at the division one, two, and three level. So they're bringing that talent over here. Um, there are opportunities with how our rules are structured with the number of seasons of competitions that students have available. The students can often go on during their eligibility and obtain a postgraduate degree or master's degree in, um, in a field that they have chosen. And so I think from there, that's when it kind of, after you're a student athlete, you're here on an F1 student visa um, as a student, but then from there, if they choose to go on and pursue a professional career, whether that be in sport or whether it be in another sector, that's when they would transition their, their visa status. And Ashley can probably tell you a bit more about that. Um, we do lots of work with our internship program, with postgraduates. Um, we have a leadership program that really helps to shape students to prepare them for that next step because ultimately only roughly 2% or 2.5% of student athletes actually go pro in sports. So we often see that they're transitioning these skills that they've learned into other career fields. And that's really um, kind of after our doorstep, for sure. I've heard the saying that 99% of NCAA athletes all go pro <laughs> in, in something else. Yes. <laughs> Greg, uh, what about social positions of, of athletes when uh, uh, they go onto the social media and they'll take positions and try and make change and state opinions? What do you do? What effect does that have on the organization, on society, on the player? Uh, that, I mean, that's a broad based question, no doubt. I, I guess it depends on the topic. Uh, you know, what, who, what the player is doing or not doing, what environment they're in, what country they're in, et cetera. I, yeah. I, I think we're all seeing an evolution, right? I mean, it's a massive evolution that's occurring. Uh, you know, I, I, I use, you know, from, from the last 10 Olympic games I've been at, you know, the evolution of a, a rule 40 in the, with the IOC in terms of uh, ability of, of, of changes that athletes are having in terms of having their voice heard. Um, and, and where the flag sticks are, but also where the parameters are, right? Um, I, I don't choose sides in any of this. I just, I, I think at, at the end of the day, if the evolution continues to occur for the good, that's a great thing. And there's no doubt that a lot of people look to athletes in, uh, in every sport, uh, in every jurisdiction. Um, and and, and um, we know and we have seen that, that change can occur because of those voices. Uh, we now have mechanisms that weren't available to us 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Social media clearly at the top of that list, depending on which social platform, right? 
Uh, some social platforms obviously appeal to uh, much, much, much more specific demographics than others, but that, that's fine. It's still an amplification mechanism that athletes, some athletes, not all athletes, are choosing to utilize to be heard. And, and to some, I think, are purposeful, in my opinion, of, of wanting to instigate said change. Others aren't necessarily doing it for that. They're, 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 they're just voicing and expressing themselves. Again, that's a, that's a, a subjective element that I, I, I definitely am not going to be the one to wade in on that. I think we could be here for days talking about just this topic. I applaud athletes mm -hmm. for um, wanting to, you know, help encourage the evolution of where things have been and where they are and where they can and shall go. Um, but it is a massive continuum, right? It, it really is. Yeah. Um, you know, from, from I use I, I keep coming back to the Olympic Games only because you know you've got 206, 212 different countries. That continuum alone, the cultures, the religions, the, um, the, the, the 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 different types of rights that are or are not had. Uh, the, each athlete, each each one of those systems is is incredibly different. Um, but what I, what we're all seeing is the evolution, and that's what I think is very encouraging to see a lot more change and positive change coming because of that it's augmenting the change that's happening in other realms mm -hmm. uh, and bruce i would just add you know as a professor at the university of tennessee um prior to my role at the state department that was largely what i was uh working towards was this empowerment of student athletes uh, to be able to use their voice for good. So what's missing to me is uh, the question is not, should we silence people or should we you know, encourage that? Or what are the parameters? The question is, how do we help athletes discover who they really are, their passion and their purpose, and then execute those things or talk about those issues in a way that doesn't disenfranchise or polarize people. So it's a, it's a gap, I think, in uh, skill training about how do you know who you are? And do you know what you care about? And if so, then do you know how to communicate that message in a positive way that uh, gains momentum? And so I think it's a it's a miss or it's an opportunity for us to to equip. May I add to that? Uh, because <laughs> I agree with with what y'all said before. Uh, you know, it, it, it's tough because everyone has an opinion and everyone has a platform, some more so than others, and not everyone is saying it correctly or the proper way to be positive. Um, but it's hard to hold athletes to a higher standard than we hold our politicians because you can't even compare what has happened in the last you know, year or so. Um, so to me, yes, education is a huge, huge issue. Uh, but when you have the stars uh, present themselves the way they are in such a positive ma manner, like Serena Williams or LeBron James, uh, you know, my hat is off to them. Um, they use their platform for positive change. And yeah, you have a lot of guys making stupid comments. And that's just the average of society that, you know, on, on average, we're not the smartest people in the world. So uh, I give them the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> and I think um, just you know, education, again, is the key. Uh, and for most of us, you know, some of us didn't go to college. Some of us didn't finish college, uh, come from a, a, you know, a poor home and, uh, you know, or playing basketball or playing football. Uh, and now we have a platform to, to talk about it and, you know, might not have the right advice to actually articulate it the proper way. But at least it's being talked about and uh, people are pushing for change and, and people realize what's right and what's wrong. Elizabeth, uh, it must be hard to come over here and study and do uh, athletics. What's the graduation rate of students coming over here? Do you know? Yeah, um, so as a whole, that's one of the things that I love about what we do and the message that we share <clears throat> as a whole student athletes graduate at a 90% graduation success rate. Bang. And that's higher than just your average student not participating in athletics. And that is because that we have put so many things into place to ensure the success of our student athletes. So you have progress towards degree requirements, making sure students are on track to achieving the requirements for their diploma. You know, there's so much assistance that's offered through athletic departments, whether that be tutors, 
athletic aids. There's just, there's so much out there to support the student athlete to ensure that they are able to go on and graduate. So I think that 10% is more likely students that leave for other opportunities outside of that. So just, I mean, the fact that we've hit that 90% threshold in the last year, um, I'll be interested to see in the coming years what COVID's impact will have overall for all students. Um, but we're just extremely proud of that graduation success rate for sure. Okay. Um, uh, if anybody has any questions, please send them to, uh, through the chat to me and I will uh, ask them. Um, uh, we've gone over the time. I have a question for Elizabeth, the NCAA. Um, do you have any control over individual states and their governing bodies of what rules they're, um, you know, push down on, on, their, on their schools? Like, for example, the state of Washington, uh, you know, as a foreign exchange student, you used to be able to play um, um, sports. Um, and uh, after I, I came to Washington, we won the state championship. Two years later, a friend of mine came, they won the state championship, and he ended up you know, playing with me at the University of Washington. The governing body passed a law that no foreign exchange student should be able to play uh, senior uh, or uh, varsity uh, sports in their first year. So they'd have to go two years to, uh, you know, to be able to play one year of sports, which uh, killed our program in the state of Washington. Because, you know, if you have a year, uh, and as you know, for a lot of uh, students overseas, it works out that, you know, after uh, 12 or 13, you can go uh, because of uh, which, depending on which school you go in, uh, you know, it's killed our program. Um, and I wonder, are there many states like that? Do you know? Um, so one thing that's very interesting, I'm glad that you brought that up, is IHSAA, which is the um, high school association. So it's kind of like the NCAA's model for high schools is actually attached to the NCAA's national office. Um, so we work very closely with them and um, their membership as well. Um, so that might be a question best posed for them, but I know ultimately that falls under their jurisdiction um, and states do have their own state specific rules. I've attended basketball with Without Borders, which you've probably worked with um, through the NBA. And I've seen times where a student can't participate in that because their state high school may have a rule that prevents them from being able to play in an outside competition during the school year. So certainly I see it happen all over the country as different states have different rules. But a lot of that, again, yes, would fall under their state's athletic association as well as, again, the um, National Federation of High School. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I think it's a disservice to the school, not just the athletic program, but just to the school to to help with culture and you know and exposure to other other people from other countries. Well, Chamberlain had a rule, a lot of rules made around him as well. <laughs> um, Ashley, we have a new administration uh, uh, with a different focus. Has that changed your? Or has that changed the operation and goals of the State Department and uh, diplomacy through sports? Well, I felt the change immediately. Uh, you know, I started in January of 2020. And that's just an honest answer. You don't know what's missing until you have something different. And then you're like, okay. Uh, and so um, it was interesting to feel that, uh, just um, the culture shift. Uh, but how we execute programs is the same. You know, we're working on bringing foreign participants inbound to experience the United States uh, from a sport, culture, school perspective. We're working to send Americans outbound. So all of the mechanisms are the same, but the strategic priorities change. Where maybe there was an emphasis in the last administration on entrepreneurship, there's now more of an emphasis on environmentalism. And so you see the shift um, in terms of foreign policy priorities, but how we execute is, or the method is the same. Is there anything specifically for Latin America, for instance? Through sports, we might be able to contribute to lessening the, the problem we have with immigration coming north. Yeah, we're focused on, um, yeah, we have several sports programs 
that were slated for 2020 that obviously didn't happen. But, you know, baseball, an important tool in Latin America. Baseball, right. Soccer also. And so both of those, we had requests from embassies from Peru, Ecuador, uh, working on the Venezuela migration, and then also some things with Mexico around uh, soccer, yes, and esports popular influential tool. So, you know, some opportunities for gamers out there. So anyway, uh, yes, Latin America, soccer and baseball and many requests from the post to deal with migration, um, immigration. Mm. Uh, we have a question, how high within the State Department does sports get represented? And the question is, will there ever be a cabinet position for sports? I wasn't gonna ask that. <laughs> I have a feeling I know who asked that. Um, but anyway, uh, maybe. Um, I think as we continue to see our role expand outside of international exchange and there be so many crossovers and so many issues, I think, globally that we're more aware of and that sport has more um, ability to change or leverage, uh, yes, maybe. Who knows? Um, I could see it happening. I, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibilities. Someone's dog is uh, wants to get involved. Neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ray Montagno has a question. Uh, Adebola, could you let him in? Already did it. I think I'm okay. Uh, I was curious about the uh, State Department relationship with the uh, U.S. Olympic Committee and there's been some debate about the boycotting the Chinese Olympics. And so what are kind of the pros and cons of doing that? There was an interesting editorial in the New York Times today about that. And so just, just kind of curious what the panelists might think about this as an issue. Well, I thought I would escape tonight without- Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. We're, we're not able to say much, but I would say that our relationship with the U.S. Olympic Paralympic Committee is tight. Uh, we work with them, I mean, weekly, uh, sometimes daily, just depends on what's going on. And so special initiatives is part of our portfolio at the Sports Diplomacy Division and mega events certainly fall within that. So we are in discussion weekly with many other bureaus all, also, uh, democracy, human rights, and labor um, policy. There are many people talking about this issue and trying to find the best way forward to avoid a boycott. Anybody else have an opinion on this? <laughs> well, I think it's tough if you're asking athletes to boycott, right? Um, yes, I think athletes have gotten more uh, vocal about where they stand in social justice, and that's that's wonderful, but. Uh, you know, for an NBA player, it's probably not a big deal to miss the Olympics because they're in the limelight almost every day. They're on TV, millions of people watch them all over the world. But, you know, my heart goes out to, to the sports that it's you know, once every four years they get to shine. And, uh, and to ask them to make that decision and take that away, you know, where this might be the only possibility in their lifetime to be on that stage um that's just not fair and and it's really hard uh, I, I sure couldn't do it if i was you know rowing or gymnastics or whatever and saying well you know not this year let's do it four years from now and you're 28 and you might never see that again yeah yeah and i'm, I'm i feel like i'm too close to it only because uh too many years of representing direct athletes or being at so many games and i agree with that if it's uh i i would like to I guess see the glass is half full and unless athletes safety, you know, like a COVID situation and a delay of Tokyo is, you know, at a premium where we can't protect those athletes. That's a different case scenario, but making a political statement and only doing it in an ad hoc uh, fashion where not everybody comes together to support that. Uh, I'd, I'd rather flip it on the other way and use it as an enabler, as a facilitator to break down barriers and to use sport to bring people together, not as a sometimes, unfortunately, a token gesture of here's what we're trying to make as a statement. So I'm not a politician, but as I say, I'm probably too close to it. And certainly seeing the impacts that it had on both 1980 and 1984, in particular, mm -hmm. winter um, and, and summer, uh, I think that's very unfortunate. I know many of those athletes to Dedlow's point that um, that was their only opportunity. And uh, I, I, you know, again, I don't, 
it's not a criticism. I just would like to think that there's another way to come at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that lets Ashley off the hook a little bit where we've kind of thrown out our own two cents and, you know, people can spin it any way they want to. <laughs> Appreciate so it. We want to know, Ashley. Um, specific, there's a question here to uh, women in Africa. And I'm looking to the State Department and NCAA uh, because sports, Title IX, and uh, we've seen a tremendous development of women's athletic in, in Europe after the Title IX advancement in the United States, there seems like a huge opportunity in Africa. Is there any uh, in NCA? are you focusing on Africa to get something done there? And then we'll come to the State Department. So we've had a couple of different projects um, that we work with. So recently um, we started working with an organization in Morocco that's actually an initiative that the King of Morocco is pushing to try to better advocate for opportunities for females in sports and the opportunity for females to come to the United States. As I'm sure we all know, um, <clears throat> one of the challenges that we face um, with highly talented students at that young age is a lot of individuals wanting to get their hands on those students for the purposes of profiting. And so one of the challenges that we see in the sport over there um, that the King brought to our attention of wanting to try to kind of create a platform to better it across the whole continent was just to remove some of the corruption and some of the challenges that they face within the sports in that region of the world. And so I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity there to continue to educate, to talk about our structure and what we do through the collegiate model. Our structure is so unique um, in the fact that there aren't many other countries across the world that have sporting teams at the college or university level. And yeah. we often get interest. We hosted a delegation from South Africa, South Korea, um, Zimbabwe. <clears throat> We've had them hosted at our national office and a lot of that is through different grants and opportunities that they've had through the State Department to come over and learn about our structure so that they can offer something similar back in their home country. So it, it, that very much is a two-way street that we are continuing to not only work to help to bring students over here, but how can we educate you on something that we've been doing for over a hundred years that's working yep. fairly well and how can we help you in creating that in your country? Yeah, that might be something our audience doesn't realize that the uh, combination of athletics and academics at a university in the United States does not exist outside uh, in other countries. And so, for instance, the NCA, uh, you, we, we are not able to take U.S. students and put them in a university in, in Berlin because Uni Berlin doesn't have a, a university team. So it's a little bit. That, so that is one sided. Uh, State Department. I have a feeling that Elizabeth just mentioned a program that you may have funded. Uh, what <laughs> yes, about Africa? I was in Zimbabwe not too long ago teaching basketball. So um, yeah, my face lit up when you said that because of the people there that I met. Um, but yeah, for us, uh, at least on the outbound portion, when we're sending American athletes, you know, we send approximately 60 athletes out per year in a normal year, in a non-COVID year to roughly 30 countries. Uh, for 2020, because of the Basketball Africa League, there we had an emphasis on six different exchanges within Africa around the sport of basketball. So Angola and Egypt and Rwanda and Senegal. And we had several things on the docket. Um, and that's for men and women, even though the Basketball Africa League is largely focused on male talent. Um, we were doing clinics and grassroots programming and policy change for men and women. And so, yes, um, we do a lot around the sport of basketball, around the sport of soccer, um, on the continent and yeah, it's a, it's a big part of our programming. I would say a third of our, or maybe a little less than a third of our programs are focused on Africa. Uh, uh, Betty Tonzing makes a good point here regarding Title IX and women's uh, entitlement. Uh, our own Birch Bayh from Indiana, the Senator from Indiana was the sponsor of Title IX back in 1972. I'll, I'll just put a number out there. So it came out of Indiana. So we're, we're proud of that. Uh, Larry, uh, uh, you have a question. Could you give Larry the microphone? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask a quick question about some of the other global sports that we haven't touched on. I mean, we have a couple of uh, outstanding basketball players here on the panel, but 
But uh, Greg's been involved in sports in Canada that aren't household names in the States. And, and I know that Elizabeth at the NCAA brings athletes here from all different sports. And I'm wondering if in a way we're missing uh, an opportunity to introduce new sports to the States that might bring a different group of people. For example, cricket is wildly popular in South Asia and in the Caribbean and other places, South Africa and so forth. If we had programs here for cricket, some of the folks that are coming might be different. We might learn more from them. We might get a more diverse student body. And I'm thinking of some of the Canadian sports that, that Greg's been involved with, particularly the winter sports. You know, do, do you see that, that those pose some unique opportunities for uh, expanding our understanding of different cultures and so forth? And I'd like to hear from Greg and Elizabeth about some of these world sports that we haven't talked about. And, whether they're as well developed and when there are, whether there are opportunities to bring some of those new sports like handball in Europe was mentioned earlier. Rugby is very popular right now in many countries and, and uh, those could create additional opportunities for interaction with different groups of people. I'll jump in. I, I, I think it's right for, for the picking. Uh, obviously can't be forced in my opinion. I think creating the opportunities is part of the segue too. And you've hit on, I think a number of those sports uh, there that would be top of mind, you know, Cricket and handball, again, very, very low participatory rates in the United States and or North America, but huge, huge followings in other portions of the world. Um, so I think that diversification can be a critical component. We've touched on it throughout this session in terms of really uh, growing the shared interests. And um, I, so, yes, I, I do. This is a bad example, but a sport I used to lead, I was CEO of Curling Canada. And I know that's not cricket, but, you know, there was once upon a time where we're, where, where curling just, you know, was not synonymous with anything United States of America, right? In 1998, when curling came back in Nagano, Japan, from an Olympic standpoint, the U.S. was, was nowhere really around uh, the, the phraseology curling as a sport. Um, spring forward 20 years later, and, and look who wins the men's gold medal in Pyeongchang, South Korea, right? I just think that that's been a huge resurgence, if you will, in development and not just cold climates, although that's more popular in various states across the country, but also a whole bunch of warmer climates, right? Where we saw, you know, uh, a, a, a great tight end for San Francisco 49ers became the champion of the sport and, and a spokesperson for USA Curling. So I do think that there are other opportunities there um, that aren't the norm and, and that's okay, right? That's breaking down the boundaries and getting thinking outside the box and seeing those developments happen. So there, I, I do think that there are some sports, uh, not just the ones you've mentioned, but others where there are some growth situations that can happen in this wonderful country. Elizabeth, can the NCAA pick that up? Yeah, um, so I think Greg really hit the nail on the head there when it comes to participation in numbers. And that's what really drives our NCAA sponsored sports and our championships. So we actually um, created a program several years ago called Emerging Sports Programs. And since the inception of that program, we've had five women's sports that have actually gone on to reach NCAA championship status. And that includes rowing, ice hockey, water polo, bowling, um, and beach volleyball. Um, um, sports in which, you know, rowing, ice hockey, and water polo specifically are extremely popular in the international space. Um, so cricket and handball are still offered at club team levels, which often have privately sponsored scholarships available. It just means that they don't fall under NCAA rules and there's not an NCAA championship hosted. It's hosted through private clubs and organizations. So it still happens on our campuses. It's just not a sanctioned sport through us. Um, a few other sports just to throw out there for you so that you're aware that are emerging NCAA women's sports right now include acrobatics and tumbling, equestrian at the division one and division two level. Um, like I mentioned, rugby, triathlon, and women's wrestling. So I think as the popularity rises in some of those smaller sports, you start to see them first become an emerging sport. And then if the popularity continues, and again, we have to have enough participants at enough schools to create it within a conference to have a championship, then that possibility is there. May I, may I ask you something else, Elizabeth, because sure. You're saying you need more participants, but doesn't it actually come down to the dollars? Because <laughs> so many schools are struggling as it is uh, with the current programs they have, and they rely heavily on donations, 
Uh, some schools have endowment funds. Obviously, where all scholarships are endowed, like Stanford, other schools are trying to get there. But uh, when you don't have a huge football program that's paying the bill for a lot of these other programs, mm -hmm. that cost, uh, from what I hear, and uh, you know, like up to a million and a half to have, you know, boys soccer, uh, women's uh, soccer, or gymnastics, uh, and they don't really bring in any revenue, right? So. There is that issue. And now, especially with COVID this past year, where schools are barely getting by, um, is that a challenge to get new programs going in the near future? I think you bring up a great point there, Dilla. That is definitely a challenge, um, as I'm sure many of you saw after COVID hit in, the, in 2020. Um, we saw a number of large programs, very large, very popular sports programs that were unfortunately cut, um, and some schools that had to close down as a whole. And that's one of the um, unfortunate and sad kind of repercussions of COVID-19's impact on our economy and on our sports world. Um, I, again, I think it finances is a part of it. I think if there's enough popularity at a particular campus or university that has a very large athletic budget, they can probably support something like that. But it comes down to if enough schools can support it to create their to be competition amongst schools to then host a championship. So if we only have a handful of schools supporting, you know, handball, there's not enough competition there in order to host a championship and to sanction it. But but there's always the opportunity of emerging sports, but I, yes, I would foresee that some of the financial ramifications of COVID-19 will probably hinder the progress of some of those emerging sports or sports that want to become emerging sports. Hey point. guys, we, I think we we're having to close down shortly, but could each of you try and summarize what we've talked about and what you'd like to see in order uh, from learning from what we've done in the past, good and bad, and opportunities we have in the future, what would the State Department like to see differently that we're, uh, that's different tomorrow such that, back to the topic, sports as global diplomacy. Does the world, um, I, uh, my son is playing basketball right now in Graz, uh, Austria. When I played in Freiburg, I had to spend a whole day to go from my apartment to the post office where they would connect me with my parents and it would cost me a hundred Deutschmarks to talk for 30 minutes. Now he and I WhatsApp for two hours every Sunday for free. That is just stunning. What, how could you, if you were in charge of the State Department, what would you do next to make the world a kinder, gentler place through sports? Oh, gosh, big question. Um, I think that we'll step one. The other one. three have a chance to prepare. Yeah, <laughs> lucky you. Uh, I think step one is I grew up in middle America. I grew up in the South. I lived in West Virginia, very small town, played basketball, Kentucky, another small town, and then also then moved to Knoxville, Tennessee. So I would love to see more American citizens involved and engaged in this kind of work. I would love to see um, the exposure take place and for people to get to know the everything between the coasts of America and, and the wonderful people that live there like in Indiana. And so I think step one is to um, for American citizens to understand that our division exists how to get involved, whether it be home hospitality, sports equipment donations, um, hosting groups when they come, working with Larry and team to bring groups to Indianapolis so they can visit the NCAA, so they can visit Greg, uh, so they can understand our sports structure, so they can meet real live Americans and understand you know, what we value, what we care about, our authentic selves, uh, that people to people understanding. So that would be my dream is to bring and expose more Americans to this work. What's the Canadian say? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll take a more, I, I like everything that was said there. I take a more generalist approach uh, to it, uh, Bruce. And I think we were talking about it offline. I mean, I, I really would just like in general for many of our myopic mentalities to go away. Right. But we, we, we have to, we have to work at that. Right. Just like bad habits and good habits. I'd like us to uh, mitigate. It's very hard to use the word eliminate, right. We're just not there, but mitigate, preconceived notions that exist. And so the examples I used earlier offline, you know, I love soccer. 
I'm currently running a professional soccer team, although it is under an umbrella of a sports entertainment uh, entity. Um, but I get very tired of hearing only about soccer, only about the United Soccer League, only about Indy 11. It's like those borders themselves, those are borders themselves, right? So I'm constantly, you know, I ran Hockey Night in Canada for years for the CBC. It's an iconic institution. I'd like soccer to look at what hockey might do or what MLB might do or not what we do here, but what's going on in Australia, you know, for 15 years has been preached as one of the best sports systems and high performance development um, areas in the world. So, you know, a number of those types of things. So continuing to break down those, those, those preconceived notions, the myopic mentality, and really go after best practices. That let's talk about earlier about, I'm not sure I completely agree that international players, for example, create the culture. I think you have to have the makings of what you're trying to do. I think there's a great augmentation of culture. I think there's an, an enhancement of culture. And so I, I really would challenge people to get outside of whatever your borders are, geographic or otherwise, and make it happen. Hey, I'll do you a favor. I never think of soccer. So <laughs> I'm six foot eight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, to my own defense, no sense in it. Elizabeth. Uh, well, Greg stole part of my answer, so I'm glad I get to go after him at least. Um, I think one of our biggest goals is just diversity and inclusion. Our Office of Inclusion is something new within the last 10 years, <clears throat> really working to make sure that our student athletes are those ambassadors that we talk about. So Detlef talked about some of the pressures that are there on students at such a young age to represent their country or represent individual <clears throat> individuals to represent the entire United States and traveling. And there's so much education. I always say one of the hardest jobs on campus is to be a compliance officer within the athletic department, because your job is to watch every social media post that a student has to watch every movement, everything that's said. And <clears throat> in trying to foster that relationship and that that nature of diversity and inclusion, I think it starts with our youth. So even before college sports, Good looking boy. at our youth level, level leagues and I, my background, <clears throat> to kind of piggyback on what Ashley said, I grew up a military brat. So I lived all over the country and was fortunate to get to experience lots of different cultures and societies that not a lot of individuals get to do. And I, one of the things that I took from that that has made me do what I do today and be where I am is how excited I got as a child learning about other cultures. And I think that's where a lot of this starts. If you start educating children, whether it be through participation on a sporting team or youth teams that get to travel overseas and play on their spring break, I think that is where the excitement to be inclusive, to learn about other cultures starts. And then that's just gonna grow exponentially throughout our culture and make changes that need to happen here in this country and in other countries. The kids are our future. I mean, it's always the same. But Larry, take over. Yes, I need to come in. This hour and a half passed like a minute and a half. I mean, Good we squad, could continue guys. to talk. This is this is fascinating. Thanks, Bruce, for for uh, leading the panel, and thanks to all of the panelists. We I think we've lost Detlef, um, but I know he had a shaky connection. So. Uh, but I really want to thank you all for sharing your evening with us and your insights on diplomacy through sports and the power that sports personalities yeah. hold through their platform to further causes of social justice and to improve relationships among all people of this world uh, that we all share. You know? So I hope we'll all feel comfortable attending live sporting events again soon with no restrictions. Uh, I can't wait to get back and with, you know, it's just, it's, it's frustrating to know that the, We've got the, this great tournament coming to town and we may not be able to, to see any of it live. But um, I wanted to uh, uh, also now remind the group that next Tuesday, March 23rd, we're returning to our winter weekly Great Decision Series with the focus on the end of globalization, featuring Ambassador Francis O'Donnell uh, coming to us live from Geneva. Detlef's back. Detlef, I was just thanking everyone. We've, we've, right. we've, uh, we've been wrapping You're things good. up. No, You're no good. problem. You're good. Yeah. Uh, our distinguished speaker program for April is going to feature someone else from the State Department, Ambassador Carol Perez from the uh, U.S. Department of State, talking about new directions in U.S. diplomacy, uh, which the, those that have recently been described by the new Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, and under this new administration. So 
uh, you'll receive information about that in due course. And you can find more information on all of our programs on our Indiana Council on World Affairs website at indianaworld.org. So now on behalf of the Indiana Council on World Affairs and the Nebraska World Affairs Council, we once more thank our panelists, our moderator, and uh, we wish everybody, we hope to see you again soon. Hope you'll join our other our programs. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Enjoy March Madness. Deb, look, we had everybody give one chance to say, what's the one message that you think wraps up what you want to leave people with in terms of the opportunities for sports diplomacy? And we didn't get a chance to hear from you. So can you tell us what you want people to take away from, That's from Deb, look? Yeah. Based on everything you've heard, based on what you've thought yourself, what would you like to have happen? It's not happening now. Uh, well, I think we should all strive to become better versions of ourselves. And uh, this, so Greg said, this, that's what everybody sports, said. Yeah. Sports diplomacy is definitely uh, one way of getting there. Uh, and I think, you know, when you uh, go through that process and educate yourself and expose yourself to different cultures and learn. Uh, you just become a better person. So I encourage you, if you have someone in your neighborhood, in your community that's different than you, uh, just say hello. Ask where they're coming from. Uh, what do they do? Uh, and, and, and educate yourself a little bit. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Perfect. Uh, we'll have this program. It's recorded. You'll be able to uh, share it with uh, your friends so if you go to our, our, our website. Also, I've asked uh, the panelists if there are any takeaways they would like us to share with you, any links to learn more about their programs. We'll post those on our website. And again, thanks to all of you. This has really been great. It's fantastic seeing all of you. I wish I could be with you live, but uh, uh, thanks again to everybody for giving us of your time tonight. And I wish everyone now, happy St. Patrick's Day. Enjoy March Madness in whatever way you want to. And uh, good night to everyone. Thanks again. Thanks, Bye -bye. panelists. Thanks, Thanks panelists, very much. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Ciao, ciao.